Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Feature films that are supposedly based on reality are often criticized for playing fast and loose with the facts, for giving real people and events the Hollywood treatment that offers us a distorted view of history. Nowhere has this been more true than with movies claiming to depict black history, which is why some film critics view filmmaker Yoruba Richin's documentary, The Green Book, Guide to Freedom, as a necessary corrective to the Academy Award-winning Hollywood film, The Green Book, which sought to portray the experiences of a talented black pianist and his white driver traveling the roads of this country in the days when most public accommodations were off limits to blacks. What are the challenges of capturing the true history of African Americans on film? And what is Richin, the director of the documentary program at CUNY's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, teaching her students? Welcome. Thank you. It's great so to how be did here. You, how did you get into documentary filmmaking? Oh, wow. Um, let's see. I kind of took a circuitous route. Um, I uh, didn't go to film school or journalism school, but I had a background. I grew up here in New York. I, I had a background in theater. Um, I was went to LaGuardia High School uh, for drama. I did a lot of theater in college. Um, and basically, in the 90s, um, after I'd graduated from college, I was trying to figure out which direction I was going to go go into, and I'd always loved documentary, um, but it never seemed like it was something that was really accessible. I never saw many of people that look, you know, many people that looked like me making films. Um, but in the 90s, the, the equipment got smaller, more accessible, and I was in graduate, a graduate program um, uh, for another in a completely different field, urban planning. But I just started working with a friend of mine uh, on doing a, a short video about how uh, the welfare reform changes that uh, that were happening at, at happening at the time were going to affect this community, this African American community in uh, in San Francisco. And it was just one of the. And then I did a, another piece on public education, and it was just one of those aha moments where it incorporated. Uh, making documentaries incorporates the part of me, the artistic part of me, and then also the part of me that wants to give voice to issues and to communities that we don't normally hear from. Okay. Now, you also spent some time as a producer at ABC News. Yep. Uh huh. Uh, were you producing uh, news stories? Yep, I worked, TV. yes, yes. So I worked for, uh, after I'd moved back to New York, I had freelanced in documentary film uh, for a couple years, and then I got an opportunity to go to the new, move to the news side. Okay. And I worked as a, uh, in the investigative unit, and I was producing, uh, producing news stories, news stories from uh, Good Morning America to Nightline, all different, you know, all different types of investigative stories. I would imagine that experience must have been helpful in showing you how to make yes. videos that told stories. Absolutely, it was very, very helpful. And uh, it was helpful in terms of, you know, having to pitch stories, in terms of writing, uh, in terms of, you know, working with camera people and editors and that sort of fast pace, it was definitely very helpful. It's always seemed to me that making documentaries must be a very satisfying uh, endeavor. I mean, in that you are using video to tell stories that you care about, to illuminate issues that are important to you. But it also seems to be a very difficult uh, pursuit. I mean, nobody hires anyone full time with benefits to make documentaries. Um, there's a constant need to raise money um, uh, to finance these films. Uh, there are no producers or movie studios fronting money for your projects. Sometimes it's, well, it's often a hand to mouth endeavor, project to project endeavor. You have to apply for grants. Um, how have you managed to make documentaries and earn a living? <laughs> well, everything you said is true. <laughs> but I will say that, you know, now I've been uh, in this field now for, gosh, um, more than, you know, 15 years. And so we've really seen a change in the industry, which is pretty amazing. Not that it's necessarily easier, but there's so much more of a demand for content, um, for stories, for documentaries, and it's happening on both sides. The audience has uh, grown, I think, for documentary films um, with the demise, actually, of the news and of um, you know investigative news departments and, and the shrinking of the news internationally. Documentarians have, 
have filled a lot of that space. And so people are hungry for that. They want that kind of information. They want those stories. And then, of course, technology. I mean, when I started, you know, uh, working in documentary film before cell phones, before streaming platforms, we've right. never imagined streaming platforms. So, um, and then, you know, now it's not just Netflix, it's these other places. And uh, more uh, investment from television production companies, traditional telev television production companies, CNN, you know, for example, is the latest sort of big, sort of old school network that is getting into the documentary uh, industry. So there, those things have definitely changed and I think have been helpful in a lot of ways. But as you said, no one hires a documentary fil filmmaker full time with benefits normally. Um, and so it is a, a, a passion and it is a, um, you really have to have passion and stamina. I was talking to uh, a broadcaster, a broadcast executive the other day um, and a project that I've been working on for a number of years that kind of went dormant because we couldn't find funding. It's now coming back to life, hopefully. And he said, you know, you have to be a marathon runner in this game. And it's true. Um, and then you also have to figure out how to support yourself uh, to your question. So I teach. I've been teaching since 2009 and I'm teaching documentary specifically for the past uh, uh, five or six years, we're actually starting a documentary specialization program. So folks who want to come to journalism school and concentrate in documentary filmmaking, we have a program that we're starting this year that we're really excited about. That's interesting. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Um, but you know, you also have, so that's one way, you also have to have multiple projects happening. So I'm working on multiple, you know, a, a, a plethora of different projects and some, you know, funding has come in, others were trying to get funding and you have to do that in order to sustain yourself. The commercial movie, The Green Book, which came out last year, was a big hit. Uh, it won Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Original Screenplay, Best Supporting Actor for uh, Mahershala Ali, and also um, Viggo Mortensen, I think, also won, uh, had a nomination, he was, was nominated. nominated yeah. um, as, as I said, it's based on the true story of black pianist Don Shirley and his relationship with his white driver and their travels around the country where Shirley performed at different venues at a time when most public accommodations were not open to black. Now, I liked the movie a lot. Uh, and then I started hearing that the movie had painted a distorted picture of Don Shirley's relationship with his family, you know, because it betrayed, you know, the Italian guy, uh, you know, uneducated guy, but has a warm relationship with his family. And Don Shirley, this brilliant pianist, but it's estranged from his family. And apparently that was not true. At least his family member said that was not true. And I also started thinking, wow, you know, here's another movie about a remarkably talented black man, but where the protagonist in the movie is the white driver, you know, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, a lot of times, so many movies that are supposedly about black figures, but the main character, the hero, is a white person. What did you think of that movie? Yeah, I mean, you know, you started by saying that I really enjoyed it, you know, and I think it's important to understand how entertainment works and distorts at the same time, right? So it has all the sort of tropes of good entertainment, right? Uh, humor, good acting, um, a journey, and, and at the end, I too was like, oh yeah, that's so sweet. He came to the Italian guy's dinner, you know? But at the same time, what media is doing is distorting our history. So um, for me, I started, so I saw the film way after I'd made, made the, the movie. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was really looking at how it, it portrayed the Green Book. I heard about the family, exactly what you had said. And, you know, how it portrayed, first off, the fact that it was called the Green Book is a little ridiculous because it, Green Book is barely in it, but also the distortion about the Green Book. Um, a few things stand out. A, uh, the Green Book, they only use it in the South, right? The, that's, the Green Book was for all across the country. It was created by a man who lived in New York, right here, um, and were places right here in Harlem uh, where he lived that, that African Americans could not go to. Uh, so, you know, the, they, in the film, they went through Iowa and other places. How interesting would a scene, a scene would have been for them to use the Green Book in Iowa? What would, 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 would have that been like? Uh, also, the places that they went that they said they got from the Green Book were dumps, right? They were really subpar and they complained about it. I think he even said, oh, this is a false advertising. 
that's not what the, the whole of the Green Book. The Green Book had uh, one of the finest, you know, as an example, like we were just talking about, one of the finest African-American hotels in the country, the Gaston Motel. They went through Birmingham. Again, what an interesting scene it would have been if they went to the Gaston Motel. So it's not only a distortion of history, it's a missed artistic opportunity as well. And then lastly, and I didn't even, someone pointed this out to me, the Green Book never touches black hands in that film. Black hands, African-American hands, never touched the book. This book that was created by us, for us, in that film, we don't even get to touch it. Did you even see the book? I mean, who was the... He, the, the, the driver. The driver. Yeah, he's okay. the one who opened it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's disturbing that in this time, in 2019, when we are having all these conversations around diversity and representation, that that film comes out um, in the way that it did. It's, it's quite disturbing. And, of course, I mean, that film was about... As you said, the, the Green Book was peripheral to that story. That was a story about a relationship, uh, however distorted it may have been. You were, uh, but what story were you trying to tell in your film? So, uh, Which came out at about the same, same time. time. Yeah, we did not know about the Hollywood film when we, made the, when we were making this film. Uh, I had shot it last July, and then uh, I think it was in August, towards the end of August, when the film premiered and won an award at the Toronto Film Festival that we uh, started hearing about the film. So this was completely separate. It's just really kismet that it all happened at the same time. Um, but what, as soon as uh, we started making this film, I realized that I, I knew that I wanted this film to show uh, you know, how, what it was, obviously, what the book was um, and how important it was to our survival but, and how it was created out of necessity, but in the, even though it was created in, uh, you know, for us to navigate Jim Crow, to nav navigate violent racist roads um, uh, of this country, it, we also used it for vacation and pleasure and recreation. And that's always been part of, a part of our history as well. Uh, very early on, the book, the title was changed uh, from the Negro Motorist Green Book uh, to the Negro Motorist Green Book Guide to Vacation and Travel, or Travel and Vacation. So that was also uh, Victor Green, the creator of the book, his purpose too, because we had, um, we had resorts that we went to uh, from that were African-American resorts. We had beaches that were African-American beaches that we went for pleasure and recreation, and we never get to hear that part of our story. Did it feature only black-owned businesses or also any accommodations that that allowed black people to come? It, it, it featured any accommodations that allowed black people to come, but uh, they were mostly African-American. Okay, okay. And it, but it, it did have... became a guide to all of these black businesses. That's right. Okay. That's right. But it did have other, um, other, you know, other races of owners. Okay. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with Yoruba Richen, filmmaker and director of the documentary program at CUNY's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Yoruba Richen, filmmaker and director of the documentary program at CUNY's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Um, starting in the 60s, you pointed this out, as the country became more integrated as a result of the civil rights movement and the civil rights legislation, a lot of these black-owned businesses started to close, and fewer than, I think, a third of them are still in business. Um, are there some efforts of, you mentioned that there are some efforts afoot to preserve some of them as historical monuments. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the, uh, one of the, the biggest efforts is around the Gaston Hotel, um, the Gaston Motel in Birmingham, Alabama, where it's been declared a national landmark, um, and there are, uh, the process of revitalizing the motel for use again is is happening. Which I is guess really partly exciting. because that's where Martin Luther King and absolutely. the ministers yes. came in. That was the Birmingham campaign. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Absolutely. So I mean, it is such a part of our essential part of our our history. Um, but also places like Idlewild, where where uh, which, which was I had one never of, heard of before. This resort yes. outside of uh, well, it's in Michigan, Northwest okay. Michigan. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the you know at one point the biggest the biggest resort in the Midwest, black or white, uh, in the 1950s. But 
uh, it's still happening, it's still going, and they are um, efforts to uh, main, re, to you know preserve the buildings, to bring people back up there, um, and you know that's something that that's still going. The YMCA, which is right here Harlem in Harlem, y. yep, the Harlem Y, which actually I'd gone to the Y all my life. I when I started this film, I didn't even know all the history of the Y, um, but they just declared it a city landmark, I believe, in the last couple of years. So there are these this, these efforts to. Um, to you know, to revitalize these these buildings. Another place in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, which uh, was a historic motel where all the jazz hotel where all the jazz greats came, was just bought, um, and they're gonna they're revitalizing that building. That was a place that was listed in the Green Book. Okay, so what was I mean? What what would you say was the the main message that you wanted to convey in your film? Um, the message that I wanted to convey in the film was really that, uh, you know, despite the hardship and the segregation and the terroristic conditions that we lived in, that we thrived as business owners, as customers, as patrons, and also as seekers of, of enjoyment and pleasure. Right. It's not just all about suffering oppression. It's no, about, that's not our... you know, the world that you created Absolutely. despite it. And we did that, and we continue to do that. Um, I also saw your film, The New Black, which came out in uh, 2014, which is about a very interesting a movie about the efforts to legalize same-sex marriage and how that came into conflict with a lot of people in the black community and with uh, black churches in particular. Um, what was your experience like making that film and what was your takeaway from it? Um, so. Uh, let me put on my new black head. <laughs> uh, so that, I started that film, um, I started thinking about that film during the election of 2008 when Barack Obama was elected president and uh, Proposition 8 was passed in California, which was at that point one of the largest uh, defeats in the LGBT community. It got rid of the recently passed marriage equality bill. And to me, I wanted to, I, I was curious how these two things happened at the same time and how we had gotten to this place where, uh, you know, this huge, arguably, you know, civil rights victory with Barack Obama uh, elected and also this major defeat for, uh, for the LGBT community and then how African Americans were blamed in California for, uh, part, for part of that defeat um, because they'd come out in, you know, droves Against it. for, well, they came out in droves for, we came out in droves for Barack Obama right. and then uh, you know, uh, by majority, and at first it was exaggerated. It said something like seventy percent of African Americans voted against it, voted for the 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 proposition, which is not true. But that kind of stuck. And anyway, these two groups were pitted against each other, African Americans and LGBTQ people. Um, and then there was no voice for African American LGBTQ people. So I really wanted to see like what was going on and how how we'd gotten to this this point. Um, I started on the the film and then. Two years later, in 2010, Marilyn took up this issue, um, and the anti-marriage equality people were led by a black minister. And so it kind of brought together all the different parts that I was looking at. And it was pretty fascinating to make the film. I mean, I was following it in real time, and no one really knew what was going to happen. So um, it was really you know, an exciting to be documenting it on the ground um, and really trying to show the complexity of how this issue was being sort of um, looked at in, in our community. For blacks, it seemed to be, it was a large, a religious issue? A, a large, large part of it is religious issue. Yeah. I mean, that is a large part of it. And that was one of the places that a lot of work was being done with an African-American church. And in Maryland, uh, the, the church is, is very big in the African-American community. So, so that definitely is one of the places. But, you know, that's everywhere. It's not just the black community. Right. I was looking at the black community. But as we know, in the Catholic community, you know, evangelical community, this, right. this is an issue. It was interesting to me, you know, and I've heard at, at the time heard blacks saying, well, you know, of, of the gay rights movement, you know, it's not the same. It's, it's not the same because we didn't choose to be black and to be slaves, but they've chosen, you know, what they are, which, you know, uh, uh, L members of the LGBT community would tell you is not true. <laughs> right. You know, uh, and it also uh, was interesting to me that, you know, the, the members of the last oppressed group, having earned their civil rights, now is against the civil rights of the next oppressed group. 
you know, but that sort of seems the way it goes. Often. Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Not just in this country. Everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. So that's, um, you know, but I think what's beautiful about it, I mean, that marriage bill did pass. And uh, right before we premiered, the Supreme Court declared marriage equality right. the law of the land. So right. it was pretty amazing documenting that process and seeing those changes. Now, of course, we're in a different situation uh, politically, uh, you know, now. So it's also very interesting looking at um, looking at that film uh, in a different in a different climate and mm -hmm. seeing how rights can also easily be taken away. Yeah. You, do you get the sense that uh, since the Supreme Court said, you know, uh, you cannot uh, make same-sex marriage illegal, mm -hmm. do you have a sense that the black community has become more accepting of it? Well, I think, we ha I think we have, and I think a large part of that was stuff that was happening during the, you know, during this time I was making the film. Uh, because Obama had changed his position right. and come out for marriage equality, right. the NAACP did, the military uh, took away Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, it was opening up a conversation. That's what I, how I always think of it. This has opened up a conversation in our community that we were not willing to have. Um, and so, yeah, I think, we, I think we're at a different place. Uh, you know, more people, more African-American out celebrities um, have helped us, you know, talk about this uh, politically. So, you know, obviously there's still work to be done every, right. in every community, but I think we have shifted, the conversation has shifted. So how is making documentary films different from making feature films? Well, I've never made a feature film, so I cannot speak from experience. I can only talk about uh, what my friends experience mm -hmm. who make features and my friends, some of my friends who do both. Um, you know, for me, I guess, I mean, obviously we're not using actors, we're not, it's not a written script. You, a lot of times, start the film and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's not scripted out. So it's this, it's this adventure. Um, and intellectually, it's an adventure too because you're constantly trying to figure out how to tell this story as you're making it. With a feature, I mean, there are some, some, some similarities to that, but you do have a script. Right. And you can tell the actors what to say. <laughs> but with a documentary, you're following events, people. Exactly. You don't know where they're going. That's right. That's right. Um, your students at, you direct the documentary program at CUNY's Journalism School. Your students, do they make, I mean, I usually think of a feature length documentary film about an hour. Yeah, um, no, they don't do that. They don't <laughs> that do that. Takes okay. a long, that takes a long time. <laughs> so they, they make, uh, for their capstone, their master's projects, they'll make between a 10 and 15 minute documentary. Okay. Uh, what are some of the subjects that they've tackled? Oh, wow, everything. Oh, let's see. Um, okay, so last semester uh, we had uh, one of the, the one of the um, most interesting films was uh, two students who were uh, grew up in the Mormon Church, and they looked at uh, sexual abuse in the Mormon Church um, through their own personal lens. Um, another student did a film about uh, his father being in prison for a lo large part of time in his life and being in a white supremacist group in prison. Uh, we've had films, um, one of the films that uh, went to the New York, uh, to New York Magazine after about looking at polyamory. Um, uh, you know, I mean, really a wide, a wide range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another film uh, uh, that was very strong looked at the land issue in South Africa. He'd spent the summer oh, yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, land distribution. And land distribution. Lack yep, of it. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. In your classes, what do you tell your students are some of the most important elements involved in making a good documentary? Well, there's things that are pretty universal about making a documentary that you need to have or need to assess uh, it, to know if it's, a good, if it's gonna be a good film. One of the biggest is characters. Who are your characters to tell this story? So a lot of times in news we deal with issues and then look at the issues uh, you know, we might have a voiceover that can tell, can, you know, help tell the story. In documentary, we look to have the characters tell the story. So that's a question. Access. Uh, what, you know, can you get in and do the filming that you need to do in order to tell this story? Sometimes you, you know, may have a, somebody who's like, oh, yeah, it'd be a great character, but you can't get access to them. Um, 
Uh, you have to think about what the arc is of the story. Um, and these are all same similar things that you think about in feature films right. too, right? right? You know, what's the arc in the story? What's the beginning, middle, and end? <laughs> Your basic storytelling structure. Uh, visually, this is a visual media, me medium. Um, so how are you gonna visually tell this story? Um, you know, I always say to my students, why should this not be a magazine article? Right. Right. So what is this? How why, why is this visual? So those are some of the the key issues to think about okay. um, that I talk to my students. about. Well, it's wonderful to know that, uh, you know, students are studying documentary filmmaking. That's right. Uh, in journalism school. Yes. That's and they really... can and they can do it right at CUNY. It's, it's a great program. We're really excited about it. OK. I'm afraid we're out of time. Can I just say if they want to, sure. where they want to sure. see the film? Um, so Green Book is available on Amazon Prime and the Smithsonian Channel app. And The New Black is available on iTunes, uh, Hudu, Google Play. Okay, great. I want to thank filmmaker Yoruba Richin and director of the documentary program at CUNY's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism for joining me today for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>